I'll say one thing for you, Davros. Your conversations are totally predictable. You're like a deranged child. All this talk of killing, revenge and destruction. Hello and welcome back to the Doctor Who Marathon. I'm your host, McEdan, and today we're going to be talking about Resurrection of the Daleks, um, written by Eric Saywood, who had proven himself previously with the Visitation and Earthshock, and is directed by Matthew Robinson, his only uh, Doctor Who story, I believe. I could be wrong, but it's his first story anyway. Um, this is uh, the first Dalek story in the Fifth Doctor era, and the first Dalek story of the 80s. Now, the thing about the 80s Dalek stories are, is that they're all heavily connected to one another. And um, they kind of form a sort of um, unofficial trilogy, as they're both, uh, they're, they're all something of the Daleks. And they all revolve around um, um, two groups of Daleks, um, one working for Davros and one working for the Supreme Dalek. And this is what kicks it off. Now, officially, this is known as um, the Dalek Civil War Trilogy. However, I don't personally like that because, um, uh, that official name, because there's already a, a official Dalek Civil War duology. Um, there were two stories in the Third Doctor era that make up a Dalek Civil War um, plotline. So, to differentiate it, I personally like calling it the R of the Daleks because each um, of the Daleks starts with an R with this being uh, Resurrection. Um, the, third one, the second one is called uh, Revelations and then the third one is called Remembrance of the Daleks. So they've all got R in the title and I, I like to call it um, the R of the Dalek trilogy. I know it sounds a bit stupid but um, it, it helps it differentiate it from um, the, the Civil War duology. Um, this is also important to note because it's the first story that was released in a new 45-minute format. Um, originally, it was supposed to be aired in a, uh, the traditional 25-minute episodes of four parts. However, during this time, which I believe was 1984, which I was correct, um, there was the Olympic Games and to make for the BBC to make up time for that, they edited episodes one and two together and episodes three and four together. This would be um, a common um, format for the series in the next season, season 23. Um, and rumour has it that it was due to that this story being so popular that they did that. However, I don't think that's actually true. But either way, um, if you get the DVD version, uh, the DVD, I believe it's only on the special edition which I have here, uh, it actually comes with two discs. and uh, You can watch it, the aired version, with the uh, two episodes, um, two 45-minute episodes, or if you're on the second disc, you can actually watch the um, four episode 25 minute formats. Now for this marathon I decided um, because I personally uh, enjoy it more in the four part 25 minute format that's the way I've decided to watch it here. I don't know if anything is cut or taken or put in into the aired version. So if I talk about something and it doesn't make a lot of sense, um, I do apologize. Um, so yeah, let's actually, let's get delve right in because I've just chatted on about this story enough. Oh, let's talk about actually the fan base because um, this would be four and a half years after the last Dalek appearance, uh, Destiny of the Daleks. Um, and despite that story being very popular, it wasn't very well uh, liked. And so this story um, has brought it back into the fan base as, um, as this is probably the second most popular Dalek story just under Genesis of the Daleks. In fact, 
Um, if you've seen my video on Genesis the Daleks, I've stated that that was the Empire Strikes Back of um, Doctor Who. Well, this story has also got the reputation of the Empire Strikes Back of Doctor Who. So, you can't win. You can't just win. So let's delve into the story. Um, the first, the, literally the first scene that we have already sets the tone for this adventure. Um, and it's a dark, gritty um, uh, setting. Um, and already we get um, iconic directing and we get a um, just a setup of the of a really grim story as we see a bunch of um, refugees um, escape through a, a so-called time corridor into modern day Earth, modern day being 1984. And um, they seem to be uh, run in from out from this building um, and a homeless man or at least a bystander anyway witnesses this as uh, seemingly the police comes and just guns them all down and not even like with a laser as in actual machine guns uh, to which also they kill the bystander setting up this how grim this story is and um, we then see the uh, TARDIS crew after the conclusion of Frontios in which the Doctor, Tegan and Turlo are trapped in a time tunnel which has taken them um, to, um, to the modern time and uh, the Doctor looks around uh, this area of abandoned buildings and um, already we get a little bit of setup for the Doctor and Tegan's character as uh, Tegan um, just wants to get out of the way, just wants to um, kind of get back to normal, whilst the Doctor is fascinated by these old buildings, although he does um, state that they are neglected, and Tiga doesn't seem to be that interested in the buildings, but uh, we can see when they walk off that the Doctor's like talking to him, you can see his arms like, ah yes, well, uh, this, this is fascinating and stuff. Um, but it's soon they um, they encounter a uh, one of the survivors of the Dalek um, of one of the refugees as one of them seemed to have survived and he um, he takes the doctor up to um, a staircase where the actual time tunnel is and it's here that they meet some soldiers now um, for some reason, I got it in my head that these are unit soldiers. However, re-watching this story, or at least in the unbroadcast um, for episode 25-minute format, um, it states that they're just military uh, personnel. They aren't actually unit, which I find is uh, really strange because their, their um, gear is very unit-ish. But anyway, uh, they are... Um, examining these canisters that they have uh, that the builders have found in this building believed to be bombs um, and these are um, these military people are uh, anti-bomb uh, an anti-bomb squad so they've come to examine this and it's also here that um, Tegan befriends a, a young lady a, the scientist of the crew um, and she is a very sweet character. She doesn't have much to do. I don't even know. I don't even remember if she is named. But um, she does. Um, this character does a great job at getting you related to her because something's going to happen to her that uh, I'll get into. Um, while all this is going on, we are then taken to a um, a prison ship. Um, holding some deadliest uh, prisons, uh, prisoners and uh, they've even stated that if uh, the ship gets taken over then assassinate the uh, prisoner and however they get invaded by Daleks and though the action scene with the Daleks when they bash into the, the scene when you first time you see a Dalek in this story really uh, shows how magnificent Matthew Robinson's directing is as he 
shows them with a lot of um, dark lighting and the new Dalek props uh, look stunning for the time and um, th uh, the first thing they do is when they bash into the door without even saying exterminate it is just murder a bunch of of the people and um, so they're going about to set off the bomb to destroy their prisoner however it seems to have failed whilst this is going on um, one of the, they actually get to destroy one of the Daleks and the Daleks retreat. However, it turns out that the Daleks are working with a, a human mercenary known as Litton, who comes up with this plan to use um, a particular gas, which is uh, very deadly and it gives people um, scarring on the body. And it's a really gruesome death as uh, we see some people who aren't wearing masks get... Um, horribly deformed by this um, this gas and whilst this is going on um, two of the crew members go into the cryogenic thing, uh, cryogenic chamber to try and kill their prisoner which is revealed to be none other than Davros continuing the plot that um, he was uh, defrozen uh, at the end of Destiny of the Daleks. So there's some good continuity here. However, they're not, uh, they don't make it in time as one of them uh, starts showing the scarring on his face and he's about to go up to the other one to ask for help, although she knows that there's no cure. So she just murders him. She just shoots him, showing that this story has a particularly high body count. And so... Uh, before she gets time to kill Davros, um, the Daleks' Amada comes in and she dies and Davros is freed. Now Davros here is played uh, for the first time by Terry Malone, who would be um, um, the last classic Doctor Who actor to play Davros. And um, he is easily uh, a lot of joy to watch. Personally, I prefer the original actor who played Davros. But Terry Malone does a fantastic job at, um, at keeping the legacy of this deranged madman who can also be very smart and also very manipulative. Um, and um, with the, this new prosthetic mask, uh, Malone gets to get uh, show off a lot of his emotions just by his lips. And... Um, with the mask so heavily detailed, when he looks down, the the eyebrows make him look really angry. And when he puts his head up, uh, he looks uh, almost innocent-like. Now, um, I'm just going to sum up a bit of the plot now, because a lot of stuff happens in this story. This story is jam-packed with plots, mainly subplots. The main plot is about Dal the Daleks resurrecting Davros because they are they lost in the Male the Movellans war um, the war that was shown at the uh, in Destiny of the Daleks in the last Dalek story and um, they lost because the Movellans have created a virus that kills any Dalek but leaves any other species intact so the Daleks have decided to rescue Davros on the sole purpose that he would come up with a cure uh, for this virus. Now, um, the story does a great job at balancing um, these two forces as Davros doesn't trust the Daleks, as he's known from past experiences, that when they're done with him, they're just going to uh, betray him again. And the Supreme Dalek, um, who organised all this, um, doesn't trust Davros and tries his best to try and please Davros as much as possible to try and win his conviction, um, which uh, seems to fail. Now, there's also a bit where Davros seems to have the ability to control people. He has this little uh, device which, when um, pointed at somebody's neck, allows him allows people to be obedient to his will. Uh, he first does it to his technician that resurrects him from defrosting. And then he does it again with a um, biologist who comes in. And later on, two Daleks that now obey his wishes 
um, setting off this Dalek civil war. And yeah, all the stuff with Davros is just really, um, really good and very interesting. And it, you keep, you know, very engaged in this plot. And if you're not that interested in it, don't worry, because there's several other plots as the Doctor, Tegan and uh, Turlo are trying to work out um, what these canisters are, turns out to be um, part of the virus that the Daleks have put there. And um, they also come up with a con find this conspiracy of duplicates um, um, uh, at the cliffhanger of part three, uh, part two, sorry. It is revealed that um, the survivor of the um, the rebellion, the survivor at the the survivor at the start of the story, is actually a Dalek duplicate who is serving the Daleks and who is put there by the Daleks to try and capture the Doctor. Um, and the Doctor gets taken to uh, the Dalek base where they plan to duplicate the Doctor and his two companions only for them to take the TARDIS to Gallifrey and exterminate the High Council of the Time Lords. It's essentially setting off uh, the Time War officially. Although this story doesn't actually do that as their plan seemed to have failed. Um, and that's mainly an aspect of uh, the story. There's also a subplot of um, a few survivors of the prison ship that are trying to... Uh, they're going to try and self-destruct the ship so that the Daleks don't, um, uh, don't survive with Davros and their plans fail, not knowing what their plans are at the moment. And the majority, uh, they get a lot of screen time and we spend a lot of time with these characters. Um, although mainly only two of them get um, big um, interest. One of them being this... Um, this um, uh, prison doctor who... Um, she's kind of fed up of her life at the moment and she just wants to get out of there. And um, she has this kind of, um, I'm bored, let's just get it over and done with attitude. And she's a very, she has some really great lines in this story. Eric Saywood really knows how to get some great banter from some side characters. The the other the other character is this uh, newbie who um, who's just come to this ship. Um... And he is concerned about the morale of the people at the start of the story. So really this story has kind of given him purpose. However, at the end of the story, when they're just near self-destructing the ship, they are uh, drastically killed by Lytton and his men. And um, it just shows how the, the, the meaning of this story. This story is about failure. Every single party of this story uh, seemingly fails um, and a lot of people have criticized Doctor Who in generally because the Doctor doesn't seem really to have much character as uh, he just wanders into this saves the day and then rescues you but this in my opinion this story really shows the character of the Doctor and it's probably why Peter Davison um, is highly um, regarded as a classic doctor. This shows Peter Davison at probably his best. Uh, maybe his second best performance. We will get to his best when we talk about his final story. But anyway, uh, this story, uh, in terms of the doctor, when he learns about the Davros resurrecting and um, him uh, basically um, helping the Daleks, the doc the, one of the most powerful scenes is when the Doctor's basically gonna, he tells Tegan that he's going to murder Davros in cold blood because um, he failed to destroy Davros and the Daleks previously, meant, uh, referencing Genesis of the Daleks. Um, but now he's decided, right, it's time to take action. Now, through, this is set perfectly in the Fifth Doctor's timeline. What makes the Fifth Doctor really work um, because a lot of people criticise him that he's just, uh, because he's so sweet and innocent, he doesn't have the more dramatic, um, exaggerated um, portrayals of his predecessor, predecessors. 
predecessors. Um, but what makes the Fifth Doctor really work is that when he's he's the most kindest, innocent Doctor, and he gets put down, the probably gets the worst um, brutal stories. As um, if you watch his story, his era from beginning to end, you know you start noticing that his stories get darker and darker uh, to the point where in Warriors of the Deep. Um, Nobody survives apart from the TARDIS team. And this is another story where there is just so much death. And it's about the Doctor basically realising that um, he tries to be a good man, but he fails to be a great man. So he's trying to basically um, correct his mistakes as he goes um, he goes to the da uh, to Davros' laboratory. laboratory um, with these two guards, that um, his two mates that have disguised themselves as Dalek troops, um, and we get the iconic line where um, Davros thinks that the Doctor is a prisoner, and the Doctor's like, "I will, I didn't come as your prisoner," and he takes the guns off one of the guards, but as your executioner. What makes this scene really work is that, despite the Doctor knowing that deep down in his moral compass. He needs to kill Davros. He needs to just murder him. He hesitates. He couldn't do it. He fails to kill Davros. Um, it reminds me a lot of the scene in Genesis of the Dalek where the fourth Doctor talks to Davros about um, the hypothetical germ. However, this time it's much more personal to the fifth Doctor as... Um, it's all about him and his failure to do what needs to be done. Um, and now he is in a situation where he can. He can do what he can. Uh, he can correct his mistakes. But he just can't resort to murder because he's just that kind. He's just that lovable, like, lovable as a person who just wants to see the best in humanity. In fact... Before the Doctor reveals that he isn't the prisoner, he actually tries to talk to Davros to try and um, persuade him to not, uh, that he's changed his ways. However, Davros basically reveals that he's still uh, the baddie. And then the Doctor, then we get that scene. And that is just fantastic stuff. That is just perfectly written, perfectly directed. The, the close-ups on the actors are perfectly paced. The acting by Peter Davison and um, Terry Malloy are just phenomenal. And the script by Eric Sabewood, he proved himself with The Visitation. He showed that he can write fantastic Cybermen stories with Earthshock. And now he's proven that he can write for Davros in Resurrection of the Daleks. Um, and so the Doctor um, fails to, to assassinate um, Davros as he gets distracted as there's uh, a battle out in, in the guard, in the outside and one of his friends gets injured. So he tries to go up to him to medical help. And this character, basically knowing he's going to die, is going to set off the self-destruct button whilst this um, allows Davros, buy some Davros some time so he can set off the Mavellan virus so he can kill all the old Daleks so where he can start off with the new Daleks. However, he kills uh, two Daleks that come into his laboratory. However, it also affects Davros as well. And the last thing we see of Davros is him basically season up and screaming that he cannot die. He's not a Dalek. He is Davros. Um, and it perfectly emphasises the, the, the racial uh, political stance of the Daleks and Davros. Because Daleks are supposed to be Nazis. They're supposed to represent fascism and racism and all that. And what's really important about... Um, representation on this uh, in at least this is what I talk about it a lot of people didn't get it but this this is what I think uh, is going on in terms of 
what the story represents at the end is that people who are usually, let's be honest, racist or sexists or uh, whatever, like bad guys then, from their point of view, they might see that other people in their groups are racist and sexist and blah, 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 blah. But they don't usually see it in themselves. And this is what I think it represents, is that from the Davros's point of view, he doesn't see himself as a Dalek. He sees himself as something different. Though he still has the, um, basically everything that makes a Dalek, his ruthlessness, his lack of um, a moral compass, his just pure hatred and lack of compassion for the well-being, the welfare of other people. And I think that's what that ending represents, is that um, that um, evil doesn't really think it's, its own evil uh, until, it's until judgment basically happens. And so that's the end of the Dalek plot. Now, Let's get back to Tegan for a second, because this is a very important story for her. And she gets a lot of baggage in this story. Um, the, the, the troopers that are uh, looking after her in the, uh, back in modern day Earth, um, they slowly get uh, replaced by Duplicate. And by the end, it's only her and the female scientist left. And... Tegan comes up with this plan to basically pretend and um, escape and w one of them to find cover, whilst the other one hides um, the canisters in the uh, in Tegan's bed, pretending that um, it is Tegan. However, the duplicates basically realise that um, realise this and their plans basically fail, and Tegan um, escapes um, for. Uh, for a brief moment, trying to get help. Um, and she cries out as um, uh, she first sees these two police officers, to which she's re uh, relieved, only to reveal that one of them's got a gun, and she kind of clicks that these are Dalek duplicates. And so she's running for her life. She's at... Um, she's basically at a pier, at a beach. And she spots somebody with a metal detector and she screams for help. She begs um, for help. But this person, uh, maybe far away, maybe because of old age, doesn't hear her. And the police officers catch up to her and held her at gunpoint. And they notice the old man, the guy with the um, metal detector. And one of them just points his gun at him and shoots him dead. There was just an innocent bystander, didn't even know what was going on, didn't even hear Tegan cry out for help. And he was slaughtered. And then they take uh, Tegan back to, um, to the building and they basically state that they're going to be taking them to the Dalek um, spaceship. And the scientist um, starts screaming in fear and um, runs away and without any remorse, without any pity, without any fanfare, the duplicates gun her down and she screams to her death. This person that basically helped T-Gun um, uh, not only recover her from her previous Dalek attack, um, which is why she stays there, why uh, the Doctor and Turlo are working around with the Daleks. Um, but also basically helped her escape and risked her life for Tegan. Gets slaughtered for seemingly no reason. Which shows the, just the downright brutality of the Daleks. This really uh, hits Tegan um, emotionally as... Um, when the story all wraps up and ends, um, the Doctor basically is like, Come on, Tegan Turlo, let's, let's go back to the TARDIS. And in a room full of just dead bodies, Tegan's like, I'm not coming with you. I can't. I just can't travel with you anymore. And the Doctor's like, 
What, do you think I want to do all these bodies murdered? Do you think it's fun for me as well? Almost raising his voice. He doesn't raise his voice. He still shows um, passion and kindness to Tegan, but you could see that um, he doesn't feel like he's getting cross. He thinks that Tegan might, from her point of view, doesn't affect the Doctor, and the Doctor's trying to show, like, this has affected me. And Tegan's like, I know, but I don't think I can live with this. Like my Auntie Vanessa said when I was air stewardess, when you stop enjoying it, give it up. And it stop being fun, this travelling and adventure. There's too much innocent blood on our hands, and I just can't take it anymore. So, goodbye, Doctor. And she puts her hand up for the Doctor to shake hands, and then the Doctor shakes her hand, and she runs off, and the Doctor's like, Please, no, don't end like this. Uh, don't let it end like this. And Turlow's like, it's no good. She's made up her choice. And so the Doctor and Turlow, um, with, um, with heavy hearts and massive remorse, go into the TARDIS and leave without Tegan. This is Tegan's final story. Now, um, Jacqueline Fielding basically gave up, uh, basically... Uh, resigned the role of Tegan because uh, she wasn't happy with some of the scripts and some of the stories that she was given. Um, mainly uh, Warriors of the Deep to which she and Peter Davison both stated as the point where they um, decided to give up Doctor Who because the, they don't felt like they didn't feel like the script was um, to standards to BBC standards. So um, it's kind of representing uh, Jacqueline Fielding's own feeling with the show. So it, there's kind of a meta text there. But in terms of just pure story as well, it really shows that um, the stories are getting a lot darker. They're getting a lot more brutal. This isn't fun and games anymore. This isn't the Doctor travelling with a young, um, smart uh, boy and two lovely ladies going around playing cricket um, anymore. This is a doctor which has had death on his hands, who have witnessed brutal murders, and a doctor who is so uh, innocent, who is so renounced of violence, that he has, in few occasions, failed to save people, failed to, um, to do... Uh, what is need to be done and that's what and this story really affects our characters and that's resurrection of the Daleks as I said this the story's a lot of plot so I've skipped a lot of of a lot of bits of it like I didn't talk about how um, how the survivor at the start of the story has this whole little subplot where he basically redeems himself and there's just so much going on that you can't call this story boring it might have a bit too much plot that it might lose a few uh, viewing audiences but for me personally I couldn't ask for a better fifth doctor Dalek story Eric Saywood has proven himself once again that he is not only uh, a great Doctor Who writer, but it's probably one of the best and really knows how to work with the uh, Doctor's recurring monsters. Matthew Robinson does a fantastic job at bringing this gloomy, dark story to life. And it is almost perfect. I still think um, Earthshock is the better fifth Doctor story, but my god, this, high, this comes up highly up there. And might even be my favourite Dalek story of the classic era. But, um, but yeah, there you go. That's uh, Resurrection of the Daleks. So join me next time where the Doctor and Turlow get some interference by, um, by Chameleon who makes a reappearance. And they get introduced to Miss Perry Brown. So I'll see you next time for The Planet of Fire. And I'll see you next time on The Doctor Marathon. Ta-da!